After Zuckertort won the second game of the match, the scores were suddenly tied and the intrigue was maintained going into the third game. Would Zuckertort be able to continue his streak or would Steinitz repeat his success from the first game and win again with the black pieces? Let's find out. So, in the third game, Zuckertort once again opened with d4 and uh, <coughs> the opening moves uh, were repeated from the first game after d4, d5, c4, e6, e3 and bishop f5 and here Zuckertort was the first to deviate with the move a3 uh, Mind you, as we have said, this opening was not too impressive by Zuckertort in the first game and here this move a3 which has some logic, it prepares b4 and then potentially c5 but there are two problems, first of all you are violating the principle of not developing your piece and second of all we have seen already in the first game that this plan of trying to um, get advantage on the king queen side and c space with c5 b4 is not particularly good for white uh, and the course of the first game <coughs> showed that very very well so here Steinitz continued normally with e6 c5 and now uh, here Steinitz decided to play a5 to prevent b4 altogether uh, it is possible not to do so, it is possible to play some move like knight d7 or knight f6, just develop normally, but it is not. this is not wrong, this is kinda uh, limiting uh, white's options on the queen side. The drawback is that you are maybe weakening this square a little bit so this knight might come in here, but that's a small concession to pay for prevention of the enemy opponent's plan. And here white plays queen to b3, which is now a little bit weird. Because, I mean, are you playing for b4 or are you attacking the queen side? So it's uh, kind of, Zuckertort is kind of, yeah, combining two plans and th this usually leaves a uh, not so good impression. And here, Steinitz simply defended the pawn with queen to c7. And after knight to c3, knight to d7, knight f4 was played, trying to, to exploit this weakness of the b6 square, but you can see that, you know, Steinitz already has three pieces in, in, in game, while Zuckertort has made already two moves with the knight, made this weird looking a3 move, moved queen early, so I don't think this opening experiment by Zuckertort was particularly successful. And here Stein is uh, continued to develop, he could have immediately striked in the center with this thematic e5 push, if you have seen my video in the first game, you will know that in this structure, where c5 has been played, a black should play against this uh, uh, base of the pawn chain on d4, either trying to take it and then pressure it or to play e4 and gain some more space. But it won't escape, it can still be played later. And now after knight g to f6, knight to e t was played, uh, trying to get the knight to g3 to attack the bishop. But once again, this is obviously not ideal development because the knight will have to move again. Okay, the position is relatively closed and in, and in closed positions you are uh, usually uh, able to violate the principles more often and lose more time but still that's not not to be recommended because Stein just continues to develop normally bishop e7 knight to g3 bishop to g6 and now bishop to d2 and um yeah, uh, the problem with this knight on g3 is that in many cases it can be vulnerable to some h5 h4 attacks um for example already here black would play h5 that's a very typical pattern with the knight on g3 or b3 this advance of the flank pawns or on g6 and b6 but okay stein is decided to play more normal we play castles and now bishop p2 and now both sides have completed kind of development white will castle but a black was first uh, to do so and b uh, when we are determining the potential of the uh, subsequent plans we have to determine the potential for the for the pawn breaks so if you will take a look at the position from the black perspective black will play either b6 or e5 both of these are very very potent and will I increase the energy increase the potential of the white pieces of the black pieces on the other hand white doesn't really have uh, that much that much of a pawn break like the only pawn break e4 is not really viable maybe you f3 e4 you would need to prepare it and you would also end up weakening this pawn and otherwise the, the other logical move would be b4 and then b5 that would be very potent but by having placed the queen in the way and losing time this is also not happening so soon so that's why not only is the position objectively better but also from the human perspective it's much easier to play for black and here uh, black plays rook f to b8 with a clear intention of playing b6 and then blasting open this b5 which will be extremely potent for the rook and uh, 
Here, b white castle, of course. Uh, what else? I mean, the computer suggests that you move the queen, but that's already the best testament uh, because this moves the queen out of the way of the rook. But this is already the best testament that white's opening experiment was was not too good. So so far, the and for a quite more moves, black has been outplaying white with the black pieces just like in the first game, or maybe less brutally, but still, black black was doing really really well. So after b6, the logical pawn break, cb6, knight b6. Here Zuckertot did uh, maybe one another inaccuracy. He put took knight to b6, uh, allowing black to activate the rook immediately. Maybe it was better not to do so, like play bishop to c3, defend the b2 pawn, and not allow black to double the rook so fast. Although still black is better. But after knight b6, rook b6, queen c3. You have to go to here because that's the only place where you can defend the. I mean, okay, you can also go to a2, but I would make an argument that's not a big improvement. And after queen to c3, queen to b7 was played. There are many other good moves you can, but this was very. This is very logical, just piling up on the b5. You can see that this b5 is hurting white, especially because this bishop is controlling the b1 square, so you can't play rook to b1 to defend the pawn. And uh, yeah, like what else are you going to do? Um, so rook a2 was played, like the computer already wants to play b4 and then give up a pawn, but of course, um, if that's the case, then white's position is really not good, uh, but okay. Like one source of counterplay is this weak pawn on c6, which can potentially be attacked, but uh, black will be able to push c5 and c4 relatively easily, and then if that weakness is eliminated, then it's a one-way street. And here rook a2 was played. And now knight to d7, preparing this c5 push. So very logical, very strong positional play by Steinitz. Uh, now he tries to get rid of that weakness. And uh, yeah, uh, then it will be a sm very smooth sailing for him. Uh, bishop d1 was played, uh, trying to play bishop a4. But now c5 comes. And yeah, now if you play d takes c5, then the knight comes, for example, to c5. Then you have also get, uh, eliminated one of your pawns. The problem is that this knight is kind of out of the game. Black now has also central pawn, pawn majority. So so that's why Sukertor played bishop a4, trying to maybe attack this knight. But the problem is that now black plays c4, which is a very good move. So now this pawn went from being a weakness on c6 to being a very uh, strong potential po pass pawn if b2 pawn, um, pawn falls very deep into the enemy territory. So now uh, wh what this does is this prevents b3 and we say that this fixes the weakness because now this b2 pawn is fixed and unable to move basically for almost the rest of the game. And uh, yeah, this is just a very bad position for white, although I mean, yeah, he, he can resist, he can try to resist. So queen c1, knight f3, bishop c3, bishop d6. Now both sides are kind of maneuvering, but once again, it is much, this much more potent position for black because now he has more space. He has a very clear target. These pieces are somewhat uh, leaving a strange impression. Bishop d3, uh, some white square weaknesses are happening. And in these kinds of positions, uh, you just, you, there is no, maybe direct win, but patience and slow improvement of the position is required. Uh, White would like to try maybe some counter chances, but for the moment it's not easy to see how to generate play for White. So f3 was played, queen b8, and now f4. I'm. Uh, this is kind of limiting this bishop on d6, but it's also a very ugly move because now it weakens all the white squares. I'm not sure if it was completely necessary, but okay. And now bishop d3, this bishop is kind of very strong here on d3, uh, influencing a lot, uh, what, uh, controlling a lot of squares. Now rook e1 was played, and now finally comes this move h5 I was talking about earlier, when uh, the knight is on g3, then h5, h4 becomes very much a, a, a idea. So now the point is that you want to kick this knight away, maybe even play h3 to open up the things. This is like one of the revelations of the alpha zero was that, they, that everybody started recognizing how powerful this h pawn pushes were, uh, even though it was understood to a certain extent in, uh, in the past. And now white played h4 in order to prevent this but probably it was better to go to the corner this is a very ugly move but you are trying to reposition the knight to a better square where it will attack the bishop control some squares and and yet at least do something because on g3 it's really not doing anything much uh, but and the problem of h4 is also that this square is weakened additionally and also the pawn on h4 will become a target as we will soon see 
So now black played queen to d8, kind of repositioning the queen and dying this pawn. Bishop d1, trying to maybe attack this pawn. g6, queen d2, very patient play. Rook b2, b8, uh, defending the a a5 pawn, which was under the attack. Uh, queen f2, and now bishop e7, uh, preparing to move the knight and finally eventually to capture this pawn on h4. And now after bishop f3, trying to control some white squares a little bit, most notably the e4 square. Here this is like, so far Steinitz has been completely outplaying his opponent, uh, totally position, total position domination. But here he starts going a little bit wrong. Uh, so here he played knight to e4. Like, I'm not 100% sure what's wrong with knight to g4. Because if he, you are forced him to take, so you are covering this attack and, the, and attacking the queen, and if you take uh, bishop g4, h g4, this pawn will be falling all the same. And uh, yeah, this white square blockade is very, very strong, and there are no nowhere near attacking chances as much as they as they could. Uh, in the game, white managed to get some so sort of a counterplay going with the king's head attack, and here it wouldn't have been the case. Um, yeah, and there was also like any other knight move was maybe better, but here knight e4 was played. Uh, and this is a little bit not optimal because you are exchanging your active knight for your opponent's passive knight. Uh, the problematic of exchanging in chess is always difficult, but in general you don't want to exchange your active pieces for the opponent's passive pieces. But here bishop e4 was played, which is a little bit strange, knight e4 was probably better. Uh, getting rid of that knight that was bothering you for the for the majority of the game, but okay, I guess the problem was after d d takes e4, bishop d1, bishop to h4, um, black wins a pawn and and retains all the p p pluses of the position. So the, it's natural the two character didn't want to do that, although it was objectively better because after bishop to e4, uh, d4, knight h1. Uh, you, 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 at the, the knight go, has to go to h1 and it's very passive here, but you know, there is at least some potential prospect of reactivating it later with knight f2 and then potentially playing for g4 push, which was actually what happened in the game. Of course, the drawback is that now you have to lose the pawn, bishop to h4, g3, bishop to e7, queen to d2, uh, queen to d5, knight f2, and now a4. Uh, a little bit strange move, I'm not sure if this is necessary, but okay, it removes the pawn from the attack and fixes this pawn even further. I'm pretty sure Steinitz was thinking that there is no danger to his position here. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the problem is that there is some potential here for white now because g4 is coming. And it's kind of instructive to see how black is, uh, how the computer, for example, wants to handle this position. The computer wants to play f6 here. And the point is here that, for example, after rook a1, king f7, king h2, you, you play g5 yourself, and you are the one who will get the attack going because you have better development and better positional control. So you are, you are permitted to open up the position in front of your own king because of the positional superiority. So, okay, but uh, Steinitz was trying to win on the queen side, so he played a4, king g2, rook b3, rook h1. King g7, rook a1, and now bishop to d8. D, uh, this is a very good move. Uh, the idea is to put eventually play bishop to a5 and eliminate this bishop, which is kind of holding the position together like a glue. However, uh, this is, you can see now that white has some pieces kind of close to the king, whereas black has one and a half piece, let's say, close to the king. And also this rook can swing in very quickly. And here, uh, what Black's slow play on the queen side allowed, allowed, it allowed some counterplay with the help of the move g4. And now things are now no longer so easy. I can tell you from my experience, when you are pushing with in a position of advantage, you really don't want your opponent to have any counterplay. And this is actually the culminating moment of the game where the tide started to swing. So here, what Black should do is simply ignore this. He should play bishop to a5. And now if g f a, it takes h5, bishop c3, b takes c3, rook a b8. I don't really care about your king side because I'm going with rook b2 and I'm going to eventually win something. There is not much danger happening on the king side, especially because you are not allowed to move this knight because then your queen would lose. So this was a little bit maybe unintuitive but very concrete way of punishing, punishing or wrapping up the game. Unfortunately, for Steinitz at least, he played hg4 here, and this is a bad blunder, because it 
allows white to accelerate the attack with the help of the move knight to g4. Now this move is, knight is very active. Now queen f2, queen h4 might come. And also there are some tactical tricks that Stein is overlooked. And here, as they say, mistake come in pairs. Bishop a5 happened, which is a big blunder. So what black should do is play something like f5, knight f5, bishop f6. But this looks extremely dangerous. Now you have activated this knight, you have weakened your king. And yeah, after some queen f2, rook g8, rook a g1, it's not entirely clear. I think suddenly black's position is really, really tough. This pawn is weak and suddenly nothing is happening on the queen side and black would have to defend on the king side. So this move h to g4 was really extremely bad because it completely changed the evaluation of the position and it violated the principle of don't play on the side of the board where your opponent is attacking this was like is the most uh, i don't know the most um, direct representation of that role and here stein is, as i said made, made another mistake after knight g4 he played bishop to a5 which is a logical uh, move from the p positional and strategic viewpoint but it just doesn't work out tactically and works much uh, worse in this concrete uh, situation because of the knight on g4. And here uh, it allows the move rook h7, a very nasty move, uh, giving this check because black can take. And uh, king takes g4, knight f6 is a fork and loses a queen. Um, and after king f8, which has to be played, rook h8 is played, uh, king to back to g7. Uh, you could theoretically go to 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 g7, but uh, to, sorry, to, you could theoretically go to e7, but then after rook to e8, queen to e8, you lose the bishop, bishop a5. So that doesn't quite work. Uh, after king to g7, uh, maybe the hope here is that uh, after rook to a8, there is this bishop to c3 intermediate move, and then there is no rook a7 check. This was this is an important uh, detail. So in in position with the king on e7, uh, if you play bishop to c3, then there is rook a7. This is intermediate move. So that's why king g7 was played. Um, and after rook h7, uh, king f8 again. So repeating the position, white played king to f2, and now all these dark squares are you know in peril because black has moved this bishop away. Queen h4 is coming, and this king is in mortal danger. For example, if you play bishop takes c3, there is b takes c3, and uh, the rooks are not double, there is no rook to b2, and I will very soon play queen h4 and, and yeah, get a mating attack. So that's why Stein is tried bishop to d8, but now knight e5 comes, and suddenly everything is perfect for white, because this queen side is good together, this bishop is out of the play, and rook h a1 is coming, and after king g8, rook a a h1 bishop f6 rook f7 was played a chicken with a move but rook f8 rook f6 rook f6 queen h4 and the the here Steinitz resigned because uh, there is no defense against various checkmates and the king is going to get killed very very soon so yeah this was a really shocking game because it was basically decided by two move blunders so up to a certain point up to the move 38 Steinitz was totally killing uh, Zuckertort positionally but then suddenly he allowed this counterplay and he panicked or miscalculated or misjudged the position missed a relatively simple tactic and within the span of the two moves the position went from being completely won for for black to to clearly better for white and then to completely winning for white after this move bishop to a5 so yeah quite a shocking turn of events maybe it was nerves maybe it was tension maybe it was just yeah things that sometimes happens but with this unexpected gift, Zuckertort actually took the lead in the match and also the initiative, as we will see in the games that are to come. So, with this unexpected gift, uh, Zuckertort took the lead in the match and, more importantly, I think very big psychological advantage as will be reflected in the next few games to come. So, if you like this video, I would like to thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to the channel and check some other videos on the channel that might be of interest and I'll be seeing you in another video very very soon. Thanks for watching once again and bye bye.